We slipped into the supermarket through the back delivery door and worked our way toward the front. Lights were flickering on and off with the same irritating strobe effect that Fly and I had to deal with on Demos so friggin' often. Maybe these guys weren't sloppy. Slovenly, and different creeps, maybe. It was all some kind of aesthetic statement. All I knew was flickering light gave me a headache and made me want to unload a clip at the first refugee from Halloween who happened to cross my path. Come on, said Albert, a few steps ahead of me now. I loved symmetry as much as the next guy. Right behind you, I quoted. It was the next best thing to dancing with him. Inside the main part of the store, the fluorescent lights were on and burning steady. But the refrigeration was off, and there was a rotten smell of all kinds of produce, milk, and meat that had been let go before its time. Ugh, said my Mormon buddy, and he hit the center of the bullseye. The meat smelled a lot worse than the bad vegetable matter, and ugh, that fish. If I hadn't been wide awake on adrenaline, compared to which caffeine is harmless kid stuff, I would never have believed what I saw next. Nothing on Phobos or Deimos had the feeling of a fever dream, compared to the spectacle of... Hell in the aisles, breathed Albert. The grocery store was as busy as a Saturday afternoon in the good old world. Mom and Dad and the kids were there. Young lovers wandered the aisles. Middle-class guys with middle-sized guts and ugly t-shirts pushed shopping carts down the center aisle with no regard for who got in the way. Nothing had changed from the way it used to be, except that everyone was dead. Zombies on a shopping spree. Eyes never to blink again. Mouths never to form words but to drool foul-smelling viscous liquid worse than anything in an old wino's stomach. Hands reaching out to grab anything or anyone that fell in their path. The sour lemon odor was so concentrated that I had trouble breathing and Albert's eyes were watering. My throat was filling with something unpleasant. The nearest zombie to us had been a big man once. A football player would have been my guess. Thick blue lines stretched across his face. I couldn't tell if they were veins or grooves or painted on. Next to him stumbled the remains of a cheerleader, whose long hair she'd probably taken good care of a long time ago in the world lost way, way back. In the previous month, the zombie girl's hair looked like spiders had tangled themselves up in their own webs and died on her head. These two were the best looking zombie couple. The nearest family was disgusting. Especially the 13-year-old boy, what had been a 13-year-old boy, part of his head was missing. It looked melted, as if a big wad of caramel had been left out in the sun and gone bad on one side. A thin, bald man looked like a scarecrow, with a laughing skull on top. His right cheek was missing and the few teeth that hadn't fallen out on that side made me think of kernels of uneaten corn or keys on an unpolished piano. Two zombie Girl Scouts carried filthy boxes in their pale hands. One dropped a box and several fingers spilled out. A man dressed as an undertaker fell to his knees and shoveled the fingers into his mouth, where they stuck out like pale worms. A dead priest groped at the attaché case of a dead account executive over a pile of fish left to rot on the floor. The zombie odor was so pronounced that I could barely smell the weak old fish. Are you all right? asked Albert. I nodded but didn't look at him. You're staring at them. Albert's words were like an echo from Fly. My old buddy always gave good advice, like not focusing on any details that wouldn't help the mission. But this was the first time I'd seen so many of these human caricatures this close when I wasn't engaged in taking them apart. I'm okay, I whispered, pulling Albert back into the shadows. We're doing fine. The stink in here is so bad they couldn't smell out live humans to save their... Lives? He finished my inappropriate image. Let's get the lemons and get out of here. There's never any arguing with good sense. But as we took another look-see, the zombie density inside the store was worse than a minute ago. Where the hell are they all coming from? I asked. Probably. Albert agreed. 
The scene was becoming even more surreal. Zombies pushing baskets up and down the aisles, grabbing cans and boxes of junk food, which would take a lot more than the end of the world to go bad. Some of the zombies were engaged in what seemed to be purposeful activity, moving items from one shelf to another and then back again. They didn't eat any of the groceries. They seemed caught up in the behavior of the past, as if the program had been so hardwired into their skulls that not even losing their souls could erase the ritual of going to the grocery store. And then suddenly the lights went out. Whatever had kept the generator going was defunct. What do we do now? asked Albert. Take advantage of the situation, I said. This is fortuitous. We should have put the generator out ourselves. We can pass easier for zombies if they don't see us. They're too stupid to do anything about the dark. If there is ever a famous last words award, I'm sure that I'll receive sufficient votes to make the final ballot. No sooner had I made my confident assessment than flickering, yellow light filled the store. Dozens of candles were lit. I could imagine Fly saying in his I told you so tone of voice, if they can still shoot their weapons, they can do a lot of other things. It was bad enough when Fly was right so often in person. Now I was carrying him around in my head to tell me when I made a mistake. Not everything the zombies lit was a normal candle. Some gave off a heavy smell of burning butter or fat. I didn't want to think about some of the items they might be using for torches. I wonder how long before they burn the store down, said Albert. They haven't yet, I said. Let's get those lemons and get the hell out of here. As we went out into the throng, my heart was pounding so hard that I worried some of the creatures would hear it. Then they wouldn't need to smell us out or see our TV commercial smooth complexions to turn us into today's lunch special. Matches still flared as zombies looked for items to light up. A price buster banner suddenly caught fire and went up in flames. It didn't set anything else on fire. For the first time, and probably last time in my life, I was grateful to be among zombies at that moment. Real, live human beings would have freaked and caused a panic more dangerous than a fire. The zombies didn't care, and of course, they didn't bat an eye. To be fair to Fly, he never overestimated zombies. He just didn't want me underestimating them. For what Albert and I had to do now, we had to count on zombie stupidity. I made my way over to a pile of hand baskets and took one. Albert stuck behind me a lot closer than Peter Pan's shadow. I passed him the basket and noticed that his hands were shaking. I sure didn't blame him. In fact, I had the strong feeling that he'd be doing a lot better in full combat against the monsters. With his religious background, bodies of the reanimated dead had to be heavy stuff. If I remembered correctly, and I always do, the Mormons had a more old-fashioned idea of the body. One thing I could give flies nuns, the Catholic Church didn't make you worry about what happened to your body in a war zone if your soul was in good shape. The more spiritual the faith, the more popular I figured it would be in the atomic age, where we can all be zapped out of existence in the pulse of a nucleus.